Hi, it's me again. I live in Trenton, New Jersey, and I'm always fascinated with the surrounding buildings, monuments, and the like. Today's topic is Robert Morris. He was born January 20th, 1734, and died May 8th, 1806. Robert Morris was a merchant, financier, and land speculator, developed buildings and gardens in and around Philadelphia. He held important political offices before and after the revolution. He was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, and the United States Constitution. He earned the nickname Financier of the American Revolution. And those of you might be asking, why is that? Well, in the years leading up to the American Revolution, Morris found himself on the side of the opposing British taxes on merchant goods. He opposed the Stamp Act of 1765 and the following measures of the Parliament that continued to levy a burden upon American shipping vessels. As the summer of 1776 produced the formal calls for American independence, Morris, sympathetic as he was to, the pro to protect the colonies from British aggression, refused to vote for independence. Along with a colleague, he abstained from the official vote, allowing the remaining Pennsylvanian delegates to support independence. He would, however, eventually sign the document in August 1776, along with the majority of Congress. While American diplomats Silas Dean and Benjamin Franklin had been dispatched to Paris to negotiate the support of the French court, Morris sought out munitions and military supplies. Morris also played an active role in trying to establish American credit. Congress could request monetary support from the individual states, but the state government were under no legal authority to honor these requests. And so by 1780, the American economy was near default and the paper money that had been printed, known as continentals, were worthless due to inflation. Hmm, this is where Morris came in. And without Congress able to pay for the needs of the war, foreign diplomats had to convince friendly European governments to loan them hard coin and gold. And so in 1781, Morris began bankrolling the needed supplies of the Continental Army on his own. Yes, you heard right. Morris began bankrolling the needed supplies of the Continental Army on his own. He officially served as the superintendent of finance, the precursor to the treasury secretary. Using his personal credit, he put up the necessary funds to ensure the loans would be honored. The American army began receiving the supplies it needed, and for the next three years, Robert Morris personally financed the American Revolution out of his own pocket. Morris' notes became widely circulated promissory notes within the ranks of the army. At the same time, Morris, with Hamilton as his advisor, had been scheming of ways to create a financial sector for the government to operate. It was Morris who proposed assuming the war debt by creating credit through a national bank. However noble these plans were, the Confederation Congress refused to listen. And so both Hamilton and Morris would resign from Congress in 1783 and 1784 as the debt from the war continued to balloon with no solution of paying it off. What did Morrison got? Well, Morris, sorry, not Morrison, Morris. Morris was nominated as a Pennsylvanian delegate to attend the Annapolis Convention the precursor to the Philadelphia Convention the following year that produced the Constitution. It was Morris in attendance at the Philadelphia who nominated Washington to preside over the deliberations, a move that was unanimously accepted in order to give the Convention its legitimacy. 
As a nationalist and long critic of the Articles of Confederation, Morris supported the Constitution and would sign it in September 1787. Morrison was then elected to the U.S. Senate by Pennsylvania in 1788. He helped broker the Compromise of 1790 that saw Hamilton's plan for a national bank in assuming the individual states war debt to establish national credit in exchange for the federal capital to be in the South. It is indeed ironic, though, that the man who became known as the financier of the revolution nearly died penniless in debtor's prison after years of bad investments. It's clear that Morris, ever ambitious, got in over his head with land speculating in the 1980s. Sorry, in the 1790s. He would not be the only victim of such a risky enterprise, but the reputation of others seems little affected by those endeavors. For Morris, his reputation has suffered because of the nature of his life's work, finance. The pivotal roles that Morris played in, in the critical years of the revolution carried less weight in these foes' eyes than the continuous scheming for more monetary gains that animated Morris's life. Is this a fair critique of that man? Hmm. It was Morris who won the confidence and trust of Washington, Franklin, Adams, Hamilton and others, not through his promises but through his actions and their results. Because he wasn't a military leader or future president and did not end his life on a literal high note, Historians have unfairly discarded Robert Morrison as an individual unworthy of our attention. Yet, his presence and continuous involvement in America politics during the founding era are irreplaceable to its outcome. Though Alexander Hamilton receives just credit for getting the nation's financial industry up and running, it was Robert Morris who was the engine behind the founding of America's financial sector. Let me know what you guys think in the comments, okay? But I do believe that this discussion, talking about these great men in their own right, is only natural that we do. So, for today, do have a wonderful day and thank you.